Hello, fellow followers of Christ, and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing, and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce, and this is The Authority. Hello and welcome to The Authority, where this week we will be talking about the great Roman uh, poet uh, Virgil. So Virgil, we had two previous ones, we talked about ancient Greek culture, and now we've moved on to, to Roman culture, uh, pre-Christian Roman culture. But Virgil uh, lived um, in the century before Christ. So he was born around 70 BC and died in 21 BC, so just 21 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, he, he was... He's best known in many respects for for for, for his, his 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 eclogues and his Georgics, which are pastoral poetry. It's a poetry about, say, country life, shepherds, etc. Um, but what he's best known for, and I think quite rightly, is his is his is his epic, uh, the Aeneid. So you know, the, the epic poetry um, is 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 is, is tell, tells a, a narrative story with a uh, panoramic sweep of history, a uh, great deal of drama. Um, so what Virgil's doing here is following in the noble tradition of Homer. In fact, if it wasn't for Homer, there would be uh, no uh, Virgil. In fact, if certainly if it wasn't for the Iliad and the Odyssey, there would be no Aeneid, as we, as we shall see. So the Aeneid, as I said, was written uh, uh, between 29 uh, BC and... Uh, about 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 the time of Virgil's death, it was unfinished when Virgil died, so twenty or so years before the birth of Christ. It's a national epic, in other words, it's a patriotic poem uh, extolling the virtues of Rome as a nation, um, but but also creating a, a national myth, uh, a, a story about the about, about the creation of Rome. How did Rome come into being? So this is the story of how Rome is founded, and then of course rises to become the most powerful city, the most powerful power in the known world at the time. There's a suggestion that it's sort of written as a work for hire. In other words, that the emperor desired this patriotic epic to be written and Virgil being the greatest poet of the time was one asked to write it. So there's an, there's an element of, you know, is there an, a mercenary motive to Virgil's writing this? And if so, you know, what were his feelings about the work? Um, and we'll return to that a bit later. But as regards, as we said, if the, the Aeneid would be unthinkable, literally unthinkable, as we shall see, uh, if it hadn't been for the Iliad and the Odyssey. So we need to talk about the, what's the relationship between Rome and Greece. Um, so there's a there's um, a scene from a Monty Python film, uh, What Have the Romans Ever Done for Us?, and there's a whole list then of the things that the Romans have actually done, building the foundations of, 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 of Western civilization. Except, of course, the Romans did not build the foundations of Western civilization. That was built by the Greeks, as we've seen, right? Our Homer was writing many centuries before, before, virtual, before Virgil. So we should be asking, not what have the Romans ever done for us? We should ask now, what have the Greeks ever done for the Romans? Because we will see in actual fact, although the Romans invaded um uh Greece defeated Greece in war the Roman empire became the most powerful empire ever Greece basically went into decline and was defeated militarily culturally the Greeks conquered the Romans because uh the Greeks uh the, the Romans adopted the Greek gods they gave them different names but they're the same Greek gods so now in 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 Rome you have two layers of gods you have the 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 should we say the uh, universal gods uh, that they, they they basically take it from the Greeks, you know, Zeus and company. The Romans called him Jupiter, but it's the same god. Um, and uh, and then the the local household gods, the local gods. So they have these two sort of two paganisms, polytheisms come together. But also Greek philosophy. So the 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 the, uh, the Romans are very uh, Platonic. 
the the ideas of of Plato have very much become the uh, the ideas of, of of Rome. The philosophy of of Athens becomes the philosophy of Rome. So in terms of reason, the Romans have been conquered by the Greeks. In terms of uh, philosophy, they've been conquered by the Greeks. In terms of theology, they've been conquered by the Greeks. And in in terms of storytelling they've been conquered by the greeks because uh as we will see that the aeneas the aeneid has its roots in the iliad uh homer's iliad and it's specifically uh in the character of aeneas the the the, the name aeneid means the story of aeneas uh, so who is aeneas well i'm going to read here who aeneas is and i'm reading not from the aeneid that virgil wrote but from um uh, uh, Homer's uh, Iliad. Come now, we ourselves may take him out of danger and make sure that Zeus shall not be angered by his death at Achilles' hands. His fate is to escape, to ensure that the great line of Dardanus, as the Trojans, may not uh, unseeded perish from the world. For Zeus cared more for Dardanus of all the sons he had had by women. So Zeus cares more about uh, Troy, the founder of Troy. And now Zeus has turned against the family of Priam, so the ruler of Troy, because of Priam's acceptance of the elopement of uh, Helen with Paris. So Priam has been accessory to sin. That's why God turned against him. Therefore, Aeneas and his sons and theirs will be lords over Trojans born hereafter. Okay, so what we what Virgil takes as his inspiration for the Aeneid is those lines from the Iliad, uh, in which we are told that it's the will of God that Aeneas will not be killed at the hands of Achilles, but will escape, uh, and he will escape so he can actually the, the the Trojan line will continue through his sons. Uh, for, for onward generations. So Virgil takes this idea and, and runs with it, literally, uh, throughout the whole course of the epic when uh, Aeneas leaves Troy uh, and journeys in order to found the city of Rome, and, and Aeneas becomes the founder of Rome. Um, so there are parallels um, between the Aeneid and the Iliad, as we've seen, but also between the Aeneid and the Odyssey. So Whereas the, the Iliad and the Odyssey are 24 books in length, the, uh, the Aeneid is only 12 books in length, and it's really divided into two halves. Books one to six are Aeneid's, Aeneid's, Aeneid's journey, his own Odyssey, his journey home. And the difference, of course, between Odysseus's journey home and Aeneas's journey home is that, that, that Odysseus is trying to return home to his old home where his uh, uh, wife and son and, and family and, 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 and people are. Whereas Aeneas is trying to found a new home, to find a new home. He's been made homeless by the destruction of Troy, and it's his destiny, his divine destiny, to found the city of Rome. So he's looking for the home, which is Rome. So books one to six are Aeneas' journey uh, to various places uh, in the known world. And he actually, he, he, he overlaps with Odysseus' journey at the same time. There are certain parts of the Aeneid where you know we, they, we even meet one of Odysseus' men who's been left stranded on the island of the Cyclops. So they're, they're, they're traveling at the same time in same places and never actually meet. But the second half of the Aeneid, uh, book 7 to 12, parallels the Iliad. So the first half's a journey, like the, like the Odyssey. The second half um, is um, uh, uh, a, 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 a war, a battle, uh, and a siege. Uh, whereby Aeneid, Aeneas is victorious and succeeds in founding the city of Rome. The theological level, as with uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, it's the will of Zeus, which is accomplished, although he's now called Jupiter, same god, different name. Rome has just Romanized the name, but kept the same gods, um, same pantheon. And the, the other theological thing is a conflict uh, amongst the gods, so Juno, that's Jupiter's wife, uh, not Poseidon, is the antagonist. Um, so Poseidon's new name, and the Romans give him is Neptune. And in, and in this, whereas, whereas Poseidon had been Odysseus' enemy, whereas Odysseus is the enemy of Aeneas, 
Well, Poseidon, now known as Neptune, is the ally of Aeneas. I, I, this is probably getting confu- confusing, like two sets of names for the gods. And the gods basically are, are, are now, th- those gods that were hostile to Odysseus are now friends of Aeneas. Those gods that were friends of Odysseus are hostile to Aeneas. So how does the epic start? The epic starts with the theme being laid out, again, following the model of Homer. I sing of warfare and a man of war. So this is militaristic, right? It's martial. The word martial, as in the martial arts, comes from the Roman god of war, Mars. Um, and so this this is basically uh, a sing of warfare and a man of war. So it's, this is going to be about the battle, the war to establish Rome as a city. It's going to be built through war and will become a warrior nation and it was founded by a man of war a warrior Aeneas so I say it's a patriotic epic uh, and that's something we have to bear in mind you know for the, both what's, what's both good and bad about patriotic epi- epics right it's a it can be jingoistic uh, it can be biased proud prejudiced but also it can show a great love of one's own people and culture and country so in the early part of the, the Aeneid, we are given a, a, a retelling of uh, the fall of Troy. But of course, this is very much uh, from uh, the, the Trojan perspective. And although it's not true or fair to say that Homer is biased towards the Greeks, we need to remember that the, uh, that the, that the villain of the Iliad is Achilles, who's a Greek, and the real hero is Hector, who's a Trojan. So he's not biased. But, 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 uh, Virgil is propagandistic. Um, you know, for, for him, the Greeks, who they've just been defeated in war by the Romans, are the enemy. So the whole story of Troy is the the Greek, the treachery of the Greeks with the Trojan horse. We're told the story of the Trojan horse. You know, and, and where we get the, the line, "Never, never trust a, a, a Greek bearing gifts," right? Because they're they're all traitors and treacherous. And of course, by that, of course. The Greeks did not defeat the mighty Trojans who are the Romans, the ancestor Romans, through a fair fight, right? They, they, they weren't strong enough to defeat the Romans or the Trojans uh, militarily. They had, to, they had to cheat. They had to be deceitful. It's only through treachery. Um, so Aeneas is visited by the ghost of Hector following Hector's death and is, is basically commanded to, to, to leave the fighting because his, his destiny is, to, is for Troy to rise from the ashes like a phoenix. Um, that's, his, that's, his, that's his destiny, so he needs to escape. We also told of Priam's pathetic fate. Um, the Greek word pathos I mean, means worthy of pity, so the word pathetic, worthy of pity. So Priam, right, he's an accessory to 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 Paris's sin in 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 refusing to make amends for the elopement uh, Paris's elopement with Helen so he's certainly not a good man but even at the end of the Iliad he has he has eaten humble pie and here we see this old man being basically in his armor which no longer fits him because he's old and withered pathetically standing by the altar trying you know and making one final stand against a young warrior and uh, obviously hopelessly so we, we, we're given these images and we also have one of the most iconic images of the family. And, and the, the, the classical epics are good at this. We mentioned in the Iliad this wonderful scene where, where Hector and his wife and his son are, are shown together with the, 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 the cuteness of the baby and, and, and the love of the parents for the baby and for each other. is It's very powerful, one of the most powerful, iconic images of the human family anywhere in literature. Well, uh, we see the same thing here. This is an iconic image of the family. It's actually been reproduced in several good works of art where Aeneas carrying his old father and Chryses over his shoulder, holding his son Ascanius by the hand with his wife following behind. This sort of, again, iconic image of the human family of 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 of, um, of, uh, of that dynamic, right? The 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 young and fit uh, son looking after the elderly father, but also looking after his own son and his wife. Um, Creosa's lost, his wife's lost uh, and dies, and he again, Aeneas gets a, vi- a vision from from her ghost and a prophecy of his destiny, and he will marry again, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
And then we have one of the great love affairs in the whole of in the whole of um, uh, literature, that between Aeneas and Dido. Um, you know, we talk about you know these these great love affairs in in in, in literature. We think of Antony and Cleopatra and Romeo and Juliet, etc. But certainly um, uh, Paolo and Francesca in the Divine Comedy. But certainly um, Aeneas and Dido are. This is another uh, one of these iconic love uh, stories. But here we have the dark side, the dark underbelly of love, and we have to understand that throughout history. Uh, there's been two understandings of love. Uh, there's love as um, the self-sacrificial giving of ourselves to the other, to the beloved, even if the other is our enemy. So it's not about feelings, right? It's about a, a rational choice to freely choose to lay down our lives, irrespective of what we feel about the other person. So that rational love rooted in, in self-sacrifice Versus the other t type of love, which is rooted in feeling uh, and is ultimately about the um, the gratification of feeling, particularly erotic love. So Virgil's very good at this because he's, he, he, he shows us the destructive nature of Dido's uh, and Aeneas's love. They are called, one of the phrases used by Virgil, prisoners of lust. In other words, they, they're so besotted uh, so drunk with their love, their passion for each other, that they completely and utterly neglect and forget their responsibilities. So, of course, Aeneas has a divine mission from the gods themselves, from, from Zeus, from Jupiter himself, to go and found Rome for, for the benefit of his son uh, and, 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 and for and future generations and for the benefit of the world because of the rise of the Roman Empire. He's forsaking and imperiling all of that divinely uh, ordained mission because he only has eyes and uh, for for Dido uh, and their passionate erotic feelings towards each other. Dido is the queen of Carthage, and she also has been rebuilding. Uh, has been building Carthage, um, and so she has the responsibility as a queen to build her own city for her own people, and she's also neglecting that. So this is you know love without responsibility, uh, and that that is not true love in because the, the the love we're talking about self-sacrificial love is always responsible for the other for the beloved so um they're prisoners of lust they neglect their duties when you know the, the naeus has to be given various visitations right from 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 his own ghost of his own father but it's not until he gets a, a message from the gods themselves when zeus and jupiter himself the father of the gods sends the messenger down so an angel right the, the, the word angel means messenger sends sends a messenger down to tell uh aeneas you know what are you playing at what are you doing here why are you wasting your time that you know what your, your your responsibility is and um so then he puts duty before desire he shows the other sort of love um uh sacrificing himself uh, for the divine mission for his son, for his descendants, um, for for Rome. But of course, Dido, he's also sacrificing Dido because Dido does not um, respond in like manner. She doesn't say, yes, well, we should be get on with our responsibilities. She's so passionate in her feelings, in her emotions. So it's so irrational in her love that her love... And I put love in inverted commas here because if it were true love, this couldn't happen. Her love for Aeneas turns to hatred when she realizes there's nothing that she can do to prevent him from leaving. So there's this, there's this, um, it's called an unconscionable love, right? A love without conscience. That's a phrase that that Virgil uses. And then there's a wonderful metaphor that that that's using it when when they're facing each other, and Dido is begging him to stay, begging him to to keep keep on with the relationship and the metaphor is that there's the wind uh, like a gale force wind like a hurricane of passion that's that's blowing and it's impacting uh Aeneas because he still has feelings towards her he's not cold towards her he still has those feelings but he knows he has to uh subjugate those feelings for, for a greater cause and a greater good um so it, we have this wind of passion that's being blown but he stands there like an oak tree. And so the oak tree, if you like, you have passion, emotion, wind, uh, 
that, that blows us hither and thither all over the place. And then you have the oak tree rooted, the will. This is the will. The will has to be rooted uh, so deeply that it cannot be buffeted and blown around by the winds of passion. A great metaphor that we're given uh, in the Aeneid. And of course, Dido's hatred of Aeneas uh, and of the Trojans is a prophecy of the Punic Wars between Rome and Carthage, which is happening in the future as regards the story, which is obviously happening a thousand years earlier, over a thousand years earlier, at the fall of Troy, 1200 years earlier or something. Uh, and, and, and the Punic Wars happened just a hundred or so years earlier uh, from when Virgil's writing. So this is a prophecy of something that's going to happen in the future, which is already in the past uh, when Virgil's writing. We have, as with the Odyssey, I didn't say much about it when we were discussing the Odyssey, um, but um, uh, there's uh, there's a vision of the afterlife in the Odyssey uh, where Odysseus visits the afterlife and visits the dead. Uh, we have uh, the same thing. We have, Virgil's just borrowing all sorts of things from Homer uh, and, and doing things with them. So the same thing as Aeneas goes, has a visit to the underworld. And there's, we, what we see is a development in theology uh here because there's no in the in the odyssey there's no great uh suggestion of the judgment of the dead you know the the dead the dead become less real they become mere shadows um uh but there's no suggestion of punishment whereas in uh by the time that uh, that virgil's writing there is this suggestion that there's um uh Tartarus is a place where where sinners are condemned. It's, it's, it's like hell. It's a place of eternal punishment, and the Elysium is like this sort of uh, sort of paradise, like a garden of peace and tranquility, where the where the just and the virtuous uh, spend eternity. So this is sense of the judgment of the dead. Um, so this is development of theology, and this is still before the time of Christ, of course. Um, uh, all this will be fulfilled, of course, in the teaching of Christ and the and the teaching of the church that Christ founds subsequently. But so this understanding of the judgment of the dead. And whereas we see Virgil adopting and adapting and developing the theology of the afterlife from uh, Homer, later, as we shall see, Dante, a profoundly Catholic poet, takes... Um, Virgil's vision of the afterlife and does things with that in his own divine comedy, which is, of course, a journey into the afterlife also. Uh, when Aeneas meets the, 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 the ghost, the spirit, the shade of his own father, Anchises, Anchises gives a platonic discourse. So Anchises, Aeneas, his father, is a, uh, a, a, a philosopher who's a disciple of, of, of the ideas of Plato. So we have, again, this understanding of, of this deeply philosophical culture and the fact that the Romans had embraced or been conquered by not just uh, Greek stories and the Greek gods, but also Greek philosophy. Um, then eventually in the second part of the book, books 7 to 12, they arrive at the River Tiber at the site which will become Rome. Uh, and what, what um, Aeneas says to his son Ascanius when they arrive at the Eternal City, Look, my son, under Mars, illustrious Rome will bound her power with earth, her spirit with Olympus. Okay, look, my son, so behold, this is yours. We're going to found this city and under, under which God? Well, not under Jupiter per se, the father of the gods, but under the god of war, under Mars. Rome is going to be a martial city, a city of war that will conquer, a city of warriors illustrious Rome will bound her power with earth so she will she will she will um, exert her political power her military might on earth but her spirit with Olympus a spirit with the gods and notice Olympus is the Greek mountain where the gods reside so they that it will be if you like one nation under God but one nation under the gods I suppose we could say and in the the second half of the book we see as with uh, again similar to the odyssey where the, the three main characters in the odyssey you will remember are, are odysseus the father penelope the wife and telemachus the son and the the the, the part of the story is the 
Telemachus's coming of age from being a mere boy, which he is at the beginning of the story, to being a man who can hold his own in battle. Well, the same thing happens in the Aeneid with Ascanius at the end, uh, with his own rite of passage, proves himself as a warrior. Aeneas gives us parallel characters. Odysseus, of course, is the villain. But uh, we also have a, the character of Turnus, who's like Achilles. He's a great warrior. He's proud. Uh, he's thought to be indomitable in battle. And, of course, there is the, uh, the role reversal here. Because here, uh, Turnus is uh, defending his city to people, this arrogant Achilles-type figure, whereas Aeneas and the Trojans are the ones doing the besieging, laying siege. So the roles have been reversed. Now the Trojans, who were uh, the defenders, have become those who are on the offensive. And then Aeneas, um, uh, fulfilling the role of Hector, uh, paralleling Hector in, in the Iliad, slays Turnus, who parallels the role of Achilles in the Iliad. So what 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 Virgil does is reverse everything. That now the the the, the, the Trojans are going to win. Hector's going to slay Achilles. Achilles doesn't slay Hector. Hector slays Achilles. All is put right. All is all is well uh, with the story retold from a Roman perspective. And so we come to the the uh, last will and testament of Virgil. What did Virgil think uh, of this? He hadn't quite finished it. Uh, I think the story's finished, but he was going to you know, touch it up a bit and change certain things. And, and you know, during his final sickness, realized it was going to remain unfinished. And his will was that the Aeneid should be destroyed, should be burned. Uh, that's his last will and testament, if you like. He obviously was not happy with it. And we can't really say why. It's certainly not because it's not a great work of literature. It's one of the greatest works of literature ever written. You know, one wonders whether Virgil was perhaps uncomfortable with his reputation being, for want of a better word, prostituted, right, sold in a mercenary fashion uh, to the emperor to produce this patriotic epic, uh, which is propaganda. Perhaps he thought that that was not worthy of his muse. Uh, this, of course, you know, we, 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 we can't know, we can't say, but we do know that his will was it should be destroyed. And we do know, of course, because we can read it, <laughs> that his will was not done. Uh, what do we think about that? Are we, are we, uh, it, it, should the, should the will of an author uh, with respect to his own work be done? Well, certainly part of us would have to say yes, right? It's his work and um, uh, it's his will. Uh, but how can any of us really wish that this great work of literature had been destroyed? And incidentally, by the way, I mentioned in the, in the previous uh episodes about history and literature uh, being a, a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces. You know, how many missing pieces are there? How many great works of literature have just not survived because they were burned or destroyed by war, destroyed by the elements, by, by, by just by time? Um, so thanks be to God for that remnant that remains, right? Th those works that we have that have been passed down from generation to generation. So irrespective of the will of Virgil, the fact is that if there'd been no Homer, there would have been no Virgil. And if there'd been no Virgil, there'd be no Dante, because as we will see when we get to the Divine Comedy, arguably the greatest work of literature ever written, uh, that is inspired very much by the Aeneid, uh, by Virgil. And without, if, if that had been lost, that had been burned, we would not have the Divine Comedy. This is the glory of tradition. This is the glory uh, of civilization. That's why Chesterton says that tradition uh, is the... Uh, proxy of the dead and the enfranchisement of the unborn uh, it's the extension of the franchise it's it, it hands on to new generations the gifts uh, uh that that have been handed down from the past thanks be to god the aeneid was not burned thanks be to god we still have it um and thanks be to god for virgil and in virgil's language deo gratias Thank you for joining me in this episode of In the Authority. Join me next time. We'll be turning our uh, attention to the authority of the Bible. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. 
For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc, as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, Check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.